Hey, what's up? So today we're going to do a manga spotlight on a manga that I have recently read and have enjoyed so much that I wanted to put out a video on it straight away. This is a manga by Mazuzo Furukawa that is titled something along the lines of Studying for a Fairy Tale. So this came in like a little slip cover. Uh, but this edition is only limited to 500 copies. As you can see here, this is copy 485. This was published in 1986 and it collects uh, a bunch of his short stories from Garo from the 70s and 80s. So the background for this manga, uh, which is actually said in the afterword, is that uh, Furukawa's, uh, Mazuzo's wife, had initially, she had like an original work that she made that was like a fairy tale. And these stories, I guess, were based on or influenced by that. But he thought that he wasn't up to par or couldn't ever be up to par to that original work by his wife. So that's why the title of this is called like studying for a fairy tale or study of a fairy tale because you know he thought he couldn't really uh, match the level of story writing uh, for his wife. So that's just the background of it. But this book is probably one of my favorite books in my collection right now just because of how amazing the manga and, and the short stories in here are. And I do have on the side, uh, out of the five or six stories that we have in this book, I've got two of the original uh, like appearances, the first appearances of these chapters in the Gari issues themselves. So I will show that off later on, but we'll get into it because, uh, man, I, I really love these stories. I have read a bunch of uh, Furukawa one-shots in Gaara before, but this is my first uh, collected Tankobon that I'm reading from him. And so there are a lot of different things and, and subject matter that this manga focuses on. It does go back and forth a little bit, but uh, you're going to see a lot of rural Japan. You're going to see a lot of uh, fantasy as well. Um, so it's amazing. So we start off with just this first little art piece. And here are these stories. So some of these stories I didn't really understand at all, but even then, just the atmosphere of the stories, the, the imagery themselves, super creative with this entire book. And uh, one of my favorite one shots ever is in this book. And yeah, I, I, I have no words to express how much I, I love uh, that specific one shot, which I'll show later. Uh, but we'll start off with just the first story, which is the titular story that was pretty uh, kind of confusing, I guess. So we are set here in rural Japan. Uh, following a bunch of kids. They're just playing around. But what it is, is that they are heading to a festival. So these three kids here, and they stumble into these two other kids. These two brothers just waiting and chilling. Um, but the kids traveling, they ask the older brother if they want to come with them to the festival. And so the older brother uh, leaves his baby brother alone, and the four of them head to the festival. So what I love about uh, this chapter, it does remind me of uh, Nagashima Shinji's art style, especially with the setting as well. It's like very simple and cute character designs uh, set in like a sort of Japanese village. Uh, so a lot of pages are them just having fun at the festival. But we do come to a point, and also just to note out this detail, very cool looking trees, just having like different designs etched into it. We get to a point where I think from what I was understanding, one of the boys uh, says that there's something hiding up in the tree. I don't know. He says something to make our older brother here want to go up and climb. So all of them are a bit surprised because this tree is gigantic, but he climbs and continues to climb despite uh, the kids on the bottom telling him to come down. And he actually just disappears. He never comes down. So here they are just calling at him, screaming, asking him to come down, but he doesn't come down. And what it said is that maybe, you know, he climbed to where his brother 
was waiting because if you remember the little baby brother was left all alone behind at the tree over here so that was very interesting it ends off just with that he just disappears and i think having those types of endings where it's just open-ended mysterious very fitting number one for the overall theme of just fairy tales uh but also quite like dark and morbid too like a morbid uh spin to things that i really enjoyed from that so that was a very strong opening chapter for me so it kind of set the tone for the rest of the manga but even then i was still pretty surprised with what other stories came uh, in the rest of the manga. And just to also comment as well, um, hopefully it kind of shows in the video, but maybe later on it will, will also uh, be a bit more obvious. There was a comment at the back saying that the originals, was it the originals? No, or was I maybe mixing it up with No, okay, never mind. I was mixing it up with a Shinichi Abe manga I was reading. That, that manga uh there was a note saying at the back that the originals had been lost and they had to uh you know make the book out of uh the garo issue appearances but that's that's shinichi abe this one uh i mixed it up so this is mazuzo furukawa but also the the quality of this book is great but sometimes the dialogue uh in the speech bubbles can be like faded out for some reason it is kind of a faded black that we see it's not very dark the ink uh but you know not too bad uh so the next one is this one is uh i guess open to interpretation because i'm not sure what had happened i only just processed what was happening in front of me visually so this translates to pandora's dot 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 uh and well referencing pandora's box um and this one reminded me a lot of well, it is referencing Pandora's box, but at the same time, reminding me a lot of uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's short story, what is it called? Something Omelas. Those who walk away from Omelas. I highly do recommend that short story. Very interesting one, but uh, if you have read it, then you can sort of see some similarities. Like maybe that Omelas story was inspired by pandora's box in the first place I, i'm not too sure i'm just thinking off the top of my head uh, but what we have here in this story is a traveler who seems to be on a journey to find god so throughout this uh this starting bit of the story it's just him traveling and finding really weird sites like this for example and something that i found quite interesting was that it had english uh, sound effects on top of the Japanese sound effects so I I guess I've never really I don't think any other manga I've read recently has had that so that was quite interesting he pops into a bar where he sees this woman a couple of different things happening as well um, but yeah this first section just weird scenery not too sure what to make of it but eventually he does come to God's house or dwelling and meets this guy so he explains that he's he's not really god i guess he's like a representative or representation of it uh but they go together and this deity explains the story of a a human who had asked for all sin and suffering to be uh eradicated so all this backstory here, these are apparently the six saints that he was a part of. A human had come to, the, uh, to them and had asked for all sin or suffering or foolishness, etc, etc, to be wiped out for humanity. They would do that, but only, for, uh, only on one condition, which was for that human to bear all of humanity's suffering so he would basically be the sacrifice he would be locked up in this little coffin or box and suffer pretty much for eternity for uh it, like for the sake of humanity you know so that 
sins and suffering and, and all the bad stuff, uh, for that all to be eradicated, he would have to bear all of that himself, which is where the similarity comes into Le Guin's um, Omelas, her speculative work. Uh, but he explains that the deity explains what happens after in that the coffin was actually discovered and pulled out. And even after reading the text, uh, the people still took the, the man out. So I guess it's kind of open and in that, in that sense. And this panel is actually just what it's like inside the coffin. So once the, the human was taken out, all suffering returned, I guess. So everything was undone, which is interesting, an interesting uh, choice and a, a cool thing to just think about, very thought provoking. Uh, but the rest of the story, I, I'm not too sure what really happens because initially the traveler came uh, wanting to, wanting to find someone to listen to his story. But after he hears that, he leaves and he goes out and sees the woman again. I'm not too sure what the significance of the woman is, to be honest. But it sort of ends there with also the woman. I'm not sure if she leaves too. Maybe she does. Um, but yeah, I that was a really, like in terms of its visual imagery, so cool. Especially like my favorite was probably towards the start, this weird head just balancing. It's very creepy. Um, but I was thinking like, you know, is this the purgatory? Is this, um, is the traveler himself the one who was, who had sacrificed himself for humanity? Like the human here? Not too sure, but that's okay. That was just a, a really interesting one to still read and experience. Um, so yeah, so the next one we have is something that is titled Engekyao. Not too sure what that means at all. I, I really don't know what that means. Um, but this one is also just another really strange and it is definitely very fantastical, but very strange. Also very um, sexual as well. Because what we start off with is this woman here, she is just chilling and there's this very phallic um, rock creature that everyone on this like island or something uh, deems is very ugly. So I will not be able to show the next couple of pages just because there's a lot of pleasuring that goes on. Uh, but after that, she kind of rejects the this creature and we get to see more of the, this, um, I don't know if it's an island, it just looks like some, like, paradise. Well, supposed to be paradise, uh, but we've got this rock creature here, there's, you know, these trees that have the bodies of women. So a lot of very uh, sexual things, just everywhere. And I will have to uh, skip over a couple of different things. But there seems to be this guy who maybe is the ruler of this place by the name of Amanera, who also enjoys himself a lot. Uh, but he tells our main girl about the rock creatures and their origins. And so if we move on, we've got some imagery. Oh no, it's got some uh, like butterflies. Pretty much the, the rock creature is isolated. And this is a very cool panel as well. Really vast. Um, but if I were to find somewhere, mm, where'd it go? The origins of the rock creature. Yeah, so apparently when, if you see in this panel here, when the sky splits like this, any rock creatures like we saw before will sort of morph and evolve to be their true form. And so what it's revealed to be is that this rock creature is actually, after the sky splits, the uh, the woman, a, a woman, like our main girl here pops up, exactly like her. So it's a big revelation for her who normally thinks of these rock creatures to be repulsive and disgusting. 
for her to find out that her origins are pretty much the same thing. And I think my favorite imagery from this chapter was this idea of the sky splitting, literally here. Now, it seems to, for them to be in some paradise, but uh, that was quite an interesting one to see drawn out. But yeah, that, that was the end of that. We sort of ended with just the two meeting and this separate panel here. So some so, sort, of sort of paradise, um, quite an odd story, but still very fitting towards this whole umbrella of fairy tales. Uh, they don't, definitely not your traditional fairy tales, not with the amount of, not with the, uh, the amount of like pleasuring you could see in there, but definitely just the, the vibe and the atmosphere of it, very mystical, mysterious. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was quite a cool one. Uh, but this next one here is the, my, my favorite, my favorite one shot of this entire book. And one of my favorite one shots that I've read just in general. So also just to let you know to, towards the end of the video, that's where I'll show the original appearances of two of the chapters from Garo. This one here had appeared, I've got that here with me. Uh, so this one is, man, I can't express how much I love this one because I think it's just very suited to my taste. Uh, it's very existential, it's surreal, it's strange, it feels like you could think about this for ages and ages. Uh, so this here is a story that is titled S8. So the letter S and the number 8. This came out in uh, the 1973 August issue of Garo. So this will be a pretty different one to the three chapters that we went through before. Um, so what we have is, firstly, you see, you see the landscape here, completely different. We have this sort of frog creature, it's not even a frog, it's just a creature uh, climbing this endless net for eternity, pretty much. And so throughout the chapter, we get more information and more insights to this creature, to this world, so for example, uh, like things fall from the sky to sometimes pierce the net that the creature has to be careful of. It's an endless, like you can even see the sun, uh, the horizon on that side. So it seems to be like an endless net. And this frog creature is just climbing it for eternity. You could see, oh, this is one of my favorite panels of this book. Just the vast net and the universe pretty much. But the design choice of this creature is so interesting. I wonder like what, like it, it feels very frog-like, but I wonder what Mazuzo Furukawa took inspiration from to design this. Um, but this creature here is actually not alone because all of these other frog creatures like them are also climbing the net. For what purpose? Who knows? It's a very abstract story. Uh, it, we sometimes get a look at the corpses of the creatures that have not made it. We see some, like, a couple of them strewn together or dead. Here, our main frog creature sort of has, like, a resentment for seeing two other creatures together. Maybe they're jealous. Who knows? And it's also developed a way to sleep as well. This is how it rests. It just uses its... Uh, legs as like a hook to just hang and rest but sometimes they will also have these bird creatures come in that they have to avoid so they are not alone in this type of universe there's other creatures that populate the place and it's just endless and it feels so empty this and it just ends off with our creature just will zoom out and ends the story there. So the reason, so the first thing I thought as well after finishing this, um, it's not really that related, but um, the first thought I had was that it kind of reminded me of uh, Tsuge Yoshiharu's The Salamander Story. They're not 
strictly the same. It was just, I think the main thing that it reminded me of was that we are focusing on two, on a creature that has been isolated. In the case of the salamander here, it's uh, just chilling in the sewer and it's narrating its own, its own story. In the case of S8, um, it's, it's not really isolated in that, yes, there are other creatures like it, but we are honed in on just the one creature. I, I'm not too sure, maybe S8 is the name of the world, name of this creature, who knows? But I think the, the main merits of this story is like how empty that existential dread that brings in, in me at least, you know, endlessly climbing something, not knowing uh, the purpose of, of what you're doing, seeing others around you, just follow something blindly as well. It's just such a well-crafted story with a pretty unique and abstract uh, way of setting the landscape and all of that. So one of my favorite one shots, I loved it so much. Um, but yeah, that was S8. It, it kind of feels like a fable, like, I guess the moral, or you could apply it to different things, but the emptiness, the existential dread, uh, and, you know, understanding what your purpose is, that's kind of what I saw from it, like, life as an endless race with no winners, seeing how many of them died, just the corpses are just sitting there. But yeah, that was super interesting, um, and I forgot to say as well, this was a part of his uh, Purple Legend series so i guess purple legend is just another collection of short stories all under the same umbrella uh but yeah that was s8 so we'll move on to another part of purple legend it, it, all these stories in purple legend are like distinct they're they're not really interconnected um they're just pretty much just short stories on their own um i don't know the chapter title of this too much i when i searched it up it came up with a buddhist temple I think by the name of Togepo Sayokuji. Apparently a temple in Shizuoka, Japan, and it's called the Togepo Sayokuji Eruption. That's the name of the uh, story at least. So this one we kind of depart from the art style of the first couple of chapters. These are more like ref refined uh, line work. In this case, we, Mazuzo Furukawa adopts a more, uh, I don't know, it's more traditional. It feels more traditional, like older Japanese art. Uh, but in this case, uh, the story is following a freeloader over here who lives at this lady's shop. Uh, the lady's daughter does not like him at all because he is a freeloader. But very confusing story. I didn't really understand this too much, but I love the uneven paneling here. All this is hand drawn. Uh, there, for some reason, towards the end, so he goes out one night, and the girl sort of follows him. One thing I do want to say as well, I love these, like pupilless, just black slits for eyes. They're weirdly um, emotive. Like, I think of Nishioka Kyodai's uh, character designs, but those are completely different because they are more empty. When you look at those eyes that Nishioka Chiaki draws, you just get emptiness. In this case, sometimes it's like, this does feel empty too, but with a tinge more emotion. Uh, for example, here, looking at the girl over here. So that's just something I noticed, but the girl follows him out. And love this panel here. We've got the crescent moon sort of reflected in the water, but it's so big. Um, the guy looks to have like a fit of hysteria for a little bit. Throws out, burns some dummy. Girl comes to him and I guess there's an eruption that happens in the background. But she starts crying. I don't know. They start fighting. He gets very abusive. Um, I'm not too sure why, but in the background, nice double page spread of um, the eruption here. And the two of them just looking on. Reminds me of like, um, I used to do in school the, 
those lino cut prints like that's the it reminds me of those that that sort of texture which you cut out with like that tool and stuff but yeah i, I don't know he's still abusive for some reason I, I don't really understand it too much but kind of just ends there so that was an interesting one because we got a little bit of a different art style compared to the previous ones um story story wise this didn't feel as fairy tale like out of the others it did feel may, maybe with the the inclusion of the temple and, and understanding the the background behind it would have made it more fitting for that but this one was probably my least favorite not that i didn't like it but compared to the others i think the others were a lot stronger than this uh and so we come to the very last chapter now uh pebble legend chapter four part one another just another story this one doesn't have a title because the other two had titles um same same sort of art style seems to be a traveler story pretty much so we have a traveler meeting uh two children at like a store and another story that i don't really understand um the the plot of I guess like they they chill with him a bit. So a lot of I just love how sometimes these scenes here they're very serene, just rural villages out in the mountains, just eating that sort of thing. And I believe here also they they do mention the red dragonfly song. Uh, Red Dragonfly song is like a folktale song, I believe. Though I don't know the significance of it too much. But yeah, maybe in these pages it's a little bit more apparent with what I was talking about towards the very start of the video, how the quality of the ink is not that great. You can kind of see how faded it is. Feels like something I would like put in a photocopy printer and would come up with this low quality, quality uh, image. So yeah, I, I don't know. It's I think that's the only downside of this book is that the ink is not that strong. It's a very faded black, but yeah. Um, rest of the story, no idea what happens. I just kind of appreciated the scenery in all these and got a very nice panel here to end it off. And yeah, so that was the end of the Tanklebond's little postcard. So the last thing I'll do is I'll just show off what they look like in the original issues. Just the two, the only two that I have. So this is a 1973 um, June issue uh, cover by Hanawa Kazuichi. So this is still, I haven't read any of these yet because I'm still going through. I think I'm on like May for 1973 now, but this is just what it looks like. I'm just going to go straight to the... Um, Furukawa chapter 159. I'll just do a little flip through. Susumu Katsumata, Shinji Nagashima, Hanawa, uh, Shinichi Abe, 159. Here we go. So, which one was this one? Ah, this was the eruption one. So, um, in a lot of these 70s Gaara issues, the ink, it's more of a blue ink. So I'll just do a flip through of this, larger format, but this is where it originally appeared. So we've got the blue ink here. I don't believe there are any differences between the, the two um, formats, the original magazine issue and the uh, Tangled one. I don't believe so, but very nice just having them in large format. I do want to see as well what the spread looks like. Oh, it fits so well. I think the blue, especially for this page, fits a lot more um, than that faded black. There we go. So this is the double page spread that we saw before, larger and in blue ink. And yeah, so that's what it looked like originally in the 73 issue and then I have also the 
eight, uh, sorry, not eight, August issue, also 1973, cover by, man, who's this cover? Uh, by, I'm, I'm not too sure, actually. Uh, oh, I think Fujisawa Mitsuo. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so where is it? So, yeah, S8. Very happy that I do have the original uh, appearance of S8. So, 75. So, quick flip through. Nagashima Shinji again. Shinichi Abe. Or is that Oji Suzuki? Let me see. Okay, here we go. So, this is S8. S8. Fukawa, this is what it looks like in the original format. Also, I do want to point out as well, the cover page of this is very interesting, like, calligraphy version of that creature. So nice. You can see that it's, it's hands over here as well. It's kind of cute, but it's a very sad existence, to be honest. But I guess, I, I guess it was just supposed to be like a parallel for um, what we feel sometimes. Especially with the context back then. Yeah, great stuff, just having this in big format again. Let's zoom up on the bird. And yeah, there we go. So that was the original appearance of S8, and here's just a little flip through of the other stuff. We've got some Pachinko by Ebisu. Oh, this is an interesting one. Hi Hi Hiroshi Manabe? No. No, I don't, I don't know. The, I forgot the name of them. I have seen their works before, though. But don't worry. Eventually, these 1973 issues will be spotlighted. I'm still going through them. But yeah, so that was the, uh, that's going to be the end of today's video, today's spotlight on Mazuzo Furukawa. Um, very happy that I picked this up. This was a pretty expensive one for something this small. It's, it's honestly a very small book. Uh, lengthwise, it's not too bad. Like, actually, no, it's kind of lengthwise. Yeah, it's even a bit short, 150 something pages, short, uh, small physically as well. But very happy that I did managed to pick this up there's only 500 copies that came out anyways um but yeah hope you have enjoyed this mazuzo furukawa spotlight uh he has put out in terms of his other tankobon he has put out one that's just called the purple legend so i'm assuming it just collects all of that but other than that uh i will have to look into more furukawa but yeah we'll see you guys in the next one bye